Welcome back to Beauty Uncovered, sponsored by Olaplex. It's Danielle Frank again, and today we're celebrating Fashion Week. So excited because we have freelance fashion stylist, Jimmy Paul. Almost stumbled on that one. Isn't that hysterical? Jimmy Paul, after us discussing it, I'm so excited that you're here. He is um, really the extent of the body of his work is probably you have seen it. He has been in all kinds of magazines. He does all kinds of session work. We were discussing that terminology earlier. But thank you so much for coming today. I can't wait to talk to you. Oh, Danielle, thank you. It's my pleasure and a treat to be with you. Well, you know, one of the reasons we're talking is that you're going to be doing the hair. Now, we're recording this before Fashion Week, to be honest, but we are, you're going to be doing Jason Wu's show. I'm so excited about that. Yes, me too. I've uh, worked with Jason Wu for quite some time. He's a great uh, fashion designer for the people that don't know on the podcast who he is. He's a big fashion designer star and he does fashion shows in uh, New York every season. And I've gotten to do quite a few with him and he's a fascinating guy and uh, he gets his, involved in all sorts of other things too. He has incredible taste. He's an incredibly uh, smart man and he loves beauty. And he loves hair and makeup and beautiful models and women looking their best and uh, great clothes and the uh, women look great. So it's a treat to be, uh, it's a treat to be working with this amazing team. Everybody on the team is the best. And so it's an honor, you know, and it's, uh, it's humbling to be, uh, to be invited and to, and this season will be my first time working with Olaplex on the fashion show and with their team and with their products. So it's a big honor, big, big moment for me. We're so excited because also they just are announcing this week that you are an Olaplex ambassador and I am so thrilled and I get mm -hmm. to talk to you first. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yes, you do. So, <laughs> but you know what? We're going to dive into all of that, but I want everybody okay. to kind of get to know you first. And then we're going like, right. to talk a little bit about fashion week and you can kind of give us some of the insider stuff that goes on in that. So sure. look, I, I have to talk about your career because, you know, I read a little bit about you where you, you started where your mother was a hairdresser, correct? Yes, yes. My mom is, is a lifelong hairstylist. Yeah, hairdresser. And uh, yes, so that my mom is a huge influence, huge influence on my career. Absolutely. I love that. I love Thank that. You. Now, is she the one that encouraged you to go to New York City? No, no. Uh, let me start from the beginning. Or were you a oh. rebel and you said, I'm going? <laughs> I was an absolute rebel. I was an absolute rebel. I'm from a, I'm from a small town outside of Pittsburgh called Swissvale. And there, Swissvale in Pittsburgh at the time, anyway, was very provincial, small place. And I don't think it was very out of the ordinary for anybody to move away period, let alone New York. Like, whenever I told people that I was going to go to New York, they said to me, why? You know, because to people from Pittsburgh, that's the big city. And if you were going to go somewhere, you'd go to the beach or something. So right. <laughs> they really didn't, it wasn't in anybody's mind. And because I was a kind of kid that lived in a fantasy world and loved music, and music was probably my first introduction to fashion because they're so tied together and the way the musicians looked was fashionable. And so I would study the way they looked and read the album covers and then the eight track tapes and whatever of, uh, you know, who took the picture and what they were wearing. And sometimes it would say who did the hair and makeup, you know, every once in a while it would say things like that. And that was all we had. We didn't have the internet. And, uh, and then, you know, maybe my mom would get, some magazines or catalogs in the mail and I would you know that became a foundation for me of the beginning and then actually besides my mom doing hair my mom doing her own hair and makeup 
and getting dressed up made such an impact on me because I saw how empowering it was for a woman. And uh, it's just alchemy. You know, it's magic. And uh, that was absolutely my foundation, that kind of combination, my being very close with my mom and my mom being uh, for a lot of the time a single mother and just how powerful hair and makeup and appearance could be. You know, how transformative. I love that so much because literally that is the reason I got into the industry was wow. that empowerment that women yes. feel when they are able to kind of actualize how, like they, the way they've always saw themselves. That is such a gift. It really is. And to be able to participate in it. And to be able to participate. And I remember I would get so excited in my, it was a very sweet moment uh, of my childhood where, you know, my mom would see that I loved how she looked and it would make her happy. And, you know, so we, it was a very intimate mother and child kind of relationship. It was part of our relationship and it would be fun for us and fun for me. And uh, so that was probably my mom's biggest influence on me. And because what I do, uh, I've never considered myself technically proficient. Now, people might argue with that, but <laughs> it's, it's really to me how you look and feel. Besides, uh, I, I, when I was little and watched my mom doing hair, I didn't think I'd be able to do it. I thought that it was far beyond my capabilities because my mom's approach to hair cutting and stuff was very mathematical. Like she would say, uh, use numbers. And I was always had a phobia about numbers and math and, and all of that kind of thing. So my approach to it was whatever it takes to make you look good, let's do that. And maybe it won't be perfect, but if you look great and you feel great, none of it matters. And that's still what I think. Uh, if And to talk about, you know, is it, I remember my mom and to talk directly about what we're we're doing. I remember being little, a little boy, and my mom perming her hair and then perming it again. And I remember thinking, like, but that doesn't look good. You're damaging your hair. And uh, so to me, the health of skin and hair and and mental health, this is how you're gonna look your best, is if you're and I started to get into, and I'm sure I saw it in some magazine, like a, a celebrity or Farrah Fawcett or someone like that, saying that they were uh, took care of their diet. And, you know, so in this most superficial stuff, I got an education out of it. it so and, and how you feel, what, how your energy is, how your health is, it all makes a difference in how empowered you feel and look. And, you know, I think somehow it's in a, in a positive, healthy way. It's our armor, right? It's an armor it's, and for a woman. Um, and I mostly do women's hair. And I will say that's where my focus is. So that's what I'll talk about today is, you know, for a woman, it's kind of a, in a healthy way, armor, you know, just yeah. like ready to face the world. You know, they're healthy. Their mental health is good. They're uh, they feel good about their hair and in their appearance and everything else of, that goes with appearance. But as I'm a hairdresser, I'll talk about hair. So, you know, I, I and like you said earlier, to be able to it's such a gift, the business on the on the great days. Right. It's it's on some days we're all human. Right. Some days aren't great. But when we hit it right, we are able to give joy to people and yes. as a hairstylist. And, and I'm, I've had moments where I made people so happy by doing this little alchemy, this little magic that I've learned that they couldn't do themselves, that they don't understand. But as a ha hairstylist, if we learn and take the time, it, it's, it's a foreign language to people. Like, how did they get to do that? Without you know? a doubt. I still think that like in many ways, even with all of the things that are on the internet, all the things that you can find in information, there's still a disconnect to the 
breadth of knowledge that we all are bringing into it and pulling it all together, pulling it all from different places. I think of how you were saying that you weren't mathematical and probably more artistic, which yes. I get, I get that, right. but you probably were pulling a little bit from everywhere. Absolutely. And then, Without a doubt. <laughs> and then you realize that, I mean, I realized that there's something sculptural about hair and yes. architectural. So in some far corner of my mind, there is a sense of math and geometry and, and but it just wasn't, it wasn't, it, it didn't hold my interest. It didn't hold my interest the way a beautiful woman would. Hold but I got to ask, I know you were mentioning eight tracks of like what music was inspiring you. I want to know. <laughs> well, my, I loved FM radio and I loved the Sonny and Cher show or the Cher oh show. Yeah. And so all of those were, uh, were foundations. And then um, I loved rock music, but when David Bowie, the single changes came and all of a sudden it was flooded with glitter rock and pictures in my little town and my little world. I started to see this. That was the biggest uh david boy was my big big thing and then later grace jones and uh david boy has a soft go. spot in my family our cat is named ziggy stardust oh my goodness like, amazing we we love david bowie in this household i, I so and they are so iconic not just obviously for their their, their music but their look was so distinctive it was artistic yeah. Yes, it was part of it. It was a package. It was a package. And the thing that was the thing that's still so amazing to me is that I felt like I found this obscure thing that the kids at school made fun of. And and now everybody agrees that David Bowie was great. <laughs> so it's kind you know, of like, and it makes me wonder. Yeah. I mean, with with all of those iconic people in that time, and granted, at that time, a lot of people did not necessarily understand it. But I wonder if in today's world, I'm like, how many people have that level of like music artists that have that kind of artistry or bringing in that is just this full package? Can you think of any? Because I'm like sitting here. I don't know. You know, I think if I think it's really about it is about youth in a way. Uh, so if I, because I was a kid when I became a fan, I think that if you ask kids today, maybe you know, Harry Styles. Yeah, who is who is inspiring you? Who is making you dress differently? Who is you know, I would say Kanye West, for instance, like, I mean, this is someone who, uh, when I look at Kanye West, he's invented colors. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at his clothes, like, of course, he wasn't, he didn't, he's not the first person to, uh, so maybe invent colors isn't quite right, but there's a palette of colors, and I, which I happen to love at my age, and, and I love the colors, like these soft blacks and, you know, the, these different shades of gray and you know beige and, and tan and uh it's incredible now i think I, of also I, like lizzo i mean because yeah, it's so incredible. unique and beautiful and artistic i think there's so many actually now that i'm thinking because i was like i wonder who because to me david bowie like that's just like has he's he's a he was his own category in my opinion absolutely and you're right Liz is a great a great example of female empowerment and mm. uh what she's done for beauty and the way she looks and uh Megan the stallion her hair and makeup and outfits are so advanced and so precise and mm. so elevated Oh and gosh, how could I forget Gaga? <laughs> That's another one. That's what? another one. Again, this is like this tremendous, and you know, this has influenced the world. So yes, imagine, imagine saying to somebody who's say 20 or 25, asking them, it's going to be someone like Lady Gaga for sure. I have friends. For sure. And for me, I am not uh, as enamored with Lady Gaga because I grew up with what I grew up with. So it's like, you know, I could say, yes, you're great. 
but I grew up with Ziggy Stardust and David Bowie, and even right. Madonna, even Madonna brand. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, it was yeah. thrilling. It was thrilling that I remember I moved to New York in 1982, and Madonna had worked, everybody was abuzz with Madonna. She had worked at a, a, a club in the East Village that we were going to, and, and then she did a single. So, you know, I saw this, and also Boy George. Uh, oh, yeah. When I moved to New York in 1982, Boy George had just started. So, you know, there's a lot of predecessors to these people. But if you're 20 now, you don't know that. You know, you don't feel that. You don't feel the impact of history the same. So I, I think that I think that the world is of style and music is doing just fine. <laughs> but, right. They all have. Here we went on a merry squirrel journey here, and I was trying to find out what what was the catalyst to get you to New York, and I got I got distracted. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you can edit this. So, uh, but I, when I was in high, so when I was a little boy, I uh, I started to talk about uh, doing hair with my mom at some point, and it wasn't really encouraged because it wasn't always a great job in Pittsburgh. And uh, you know, I think my mom wanted me to go to college or wanted a bigger life for me than what hair could um, give me. And also she told me something quite interesting more recently that she wasn't sure it would keep my interest. So that, you know, maybe kind of maintenance, say in a salon, a lot of times we're doing maintenance, right? We're doing little trims. Touch up. <laughs> yes. And so she didn't think that would keep my interest. And it's incredibly insightful because I agree it would have been hard for me. And, uh, so I, I became a very rebellious teenager, uh, uh, unbeknownst to myself. All of a sudden that started happening and I started to go out to nightclubs a lot. And uh, I had heard some friends move to New York and I thought that's where I want to be. I want to be around those nightclubs. I want to be around the fashion world. I want to be around uh, the music world. And I, I want to find what, I want to do. I, I didn't know if I wanted to be a fashion designer or work in that part of fashion world. I didn't know if I wanted to. I didn't know. But I, I knew that I loved dressing up and I loved uh, clothes and fashion magazines and stuff. So I came to New York and my first jobs were in nightclubs and, you know, beginning jobs and you need to do something. And I found some I found a community in the nightclub world. And I made some amazing friends that I'm still friends with now, including Danilo, uh, the hairstylist, uh, and Orlando Pita, and uh, different people. And I, at some point, I didn't have a lot of confidence, but I guess my guess is that maybe in my subconscious, I thought maybe I can do what they do. Maybe I'll be able to figure it out. And I went to... Uh, a beauty school and called Robert Fiance. And I, Robert I just Fionce. thought, sorry, I'm like having flashbacks. Yes, no <laughs> so it's no longer in business, but it was one of the, the only ones then. So I went to, uh, just to go see, I thought, let me just go see what it would be like and what, what the steps would be. And I, I'm guessing now that the uh, the woman that I met that showed me to sh uh, school was on commission of some sort, mm. right? I didn't put these together. Did she sell it hard? <laughs> and I thought, her, you know, I can't afford to to go now, but I wanted to ask you what it costs and what it would be like. And and she said, I can get you a grant and a loan, and you could start next week. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. So, all I had, I'd lost all of my uh, uh, ID. All I had was like a little paper so social security card. I don't think I even had a, a driver's, uh, I mean, a birth certificate. And she, I got a loan with that. Can you imagine? You could never do that now. It's a completely nope. different world. So I started beauty school. I was terrible. I had absolutely no sense of uh, dexterity and or the focus 
that you need. I, I think people don't realize you needed a tremendous amount of focus to do hair and concentration. And I had to build that like a muscle. And I also had to build dexterity. Like I think that women uh, sometimes have a great advantage as hairstylists because they're used to uh, even doing like their own hair or doing like basic plaits from when they're a little girl, basic braiding, or maybe they've blown out their hair before. Well, I had never done any of that. I mean, I did have hair then, but you know, maybe I put gel in it or, or wax right. or something. So that's as, as much as I did. But from my lifetime of looking, it took me years, but I got, it took me years to get out of my fingers what my imagination that was a very long process. That's but that's a hard one. It is actually yeah. really hard. Um, yeah. And, and it, it is almost like a muscle also. Yes. Not, not just the dexterity and, and all that, but it's there's like a muscle that you can cramp if you're not practicing regularly. Absolutely. Yes, it, it's, uh, it's a very, very long process. It took me years. It took me years. Now, I've seen people go much faster than me. But, you know, get get good much faster than I did. But it took me a long time. So knowing that you come out of beauty school, just like anybody else, you go into a salon, you know, we all learn, you know, the different processes that we do. What was it that got you to the point where you're doing you're do, I mean, you're doing fashion, quite frankly, you're you're yeah. doing beautiful um, editorial work. I, I was Thank looking you. at some of the covers you did. Oh, be Thank still you. my heart. I was like, oh, that's the kind of stuff that I would get excited about when it came to hairdressing when I first started. So yes, I'm dying of curiosity. Like, what was it that was a transition to that? Well, I I have to say it was like a pipe dream, but that's why I went to beauty school. Because I had met people and I had heard about this world and I lived in New York and I thought, go to beauty school in my naivete, go to beauty school. And actually, I talked to a makeup artist and I thought, you know, maybe I want to be a makeup artist. I don't know. And, and she said, well, go to beauty school because that way you'll have a trade and you'll know how you'll have a foundation. And I thought, oh, like my mom. I don't know, maybe. So I went to Robert Beyonce. And so I backed that story up a little bit. But uh, so then I, while I was in beauty school, I needed a job. So I, I started to go to some salons. And I started to go to some of the top salons. And I got hired at this one salon. And they had people there that had worked for Vogue and things like that. And I, it was so strict and they were so, in my mind, mean, but it's probably in their mind, they just were trying to get the job done and I wasn't catching on. And uh, I thought, there's no way I'd ever get to do, I can't even do this. I can't even be an yeah. assistant, let alone. So I definitely got my uh, self-esteem uh, I think trout. a lot of people just assume like, oh, go to beauty school. And by the time you come out, you're doing hair. But the truth is, is that like, it is extensive. It's oh, yes. extensive. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to get to some place that they have some kind of mentoring or um, classes or something, it's so needed because it takes a hot minute to learn all that. It really does. It, well, and with it proficiency. Really it really it took me extra it took me extra long it really did so for any of you slow learners out there believe me i was one so my first job funny enough coincidental as far as uh, all the plex is concerned was in salons what they always need is a color assistant it's sort of like the toughest job to to fill so my first jobs were as a color assistant. And it's, it's, it's quite hard to yeah. shampoo out the color. And I had to learn that. And, uh, and that alone is a lesson. So I, I have a tremendous appreciation for great hair color. It's a talk about alchemy and talk about magic and talk about skill level and 
patience and artistry. Uh, I have tremendous respect for it. In fact, I didn't ever feel like I was good enough at it. You know, I was sort of, it just wasn't my, I wasn't good enough, to be honest. And so at one point, uh, there was a man named Oribe who, uh, you know, a very famous hairstylist named Oribe. And I started to uh, read his credits in magazines and and notice that he was working with the photographer Stephen Mizell and doing all of these beautiful, beautiful pictures and hairstyles. And I thought, I wanted, that's what I like. This is my thing at the moment. I love what these guys are doing. Then I started to see ads for that Orbe was opening a salon. Oh. And I thought to myself, hmm, all right, I'm working as a hair colorist. I'm not thriving. I'm I think I was 23. I thought maybe I could go back to be an assistant and start and try to learn my dream, right? My which was to work in the fashion business. That's like so, a hard decision, though. You got to admit, even at 20. Very hard. It was a very hard decision because as once you, you get used to that money. <laughs> I'll be honest, I never made a lot, but I made more than I ever had. Right. So then, just as luck would have it, Danilo, who I mentioned earlier, uh, I run into him, and he tells me I'm going to work at I'm going to work at the Orbe Salon. And I said, Oh, I was thinking about it. He said, You could use me as a rec- you know a recommendation. So I go there, and I'm thinking there's going to be lines around the block. They're never going to hire me. Why would they hire me whenever everybody in New York is going to want to work there? And I I keep thinking of this one word, and it is forecasting, right? Forecasting meaning like uh, that you're going to guess what the future is, right? What the future of trends are. And I think that is is what you see in fashion and that you'll see the next thing, right? So you might see something or a hairstyle or clothes or a look, and you might think, I don't like that. But in six months, you might be wearing that, right? So that's the idea of forecasting something forward. And I didn't know it, but I do believe that's one of my gifts. So when I went to apply for a job at Orbe, there was no one else there. They were desperate for an assistant. (laughs) I started like the next day. So I would say if I have any gifts, that's one of them. You're able uh, to predict what's the next best thing. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't put money on it, but I, in that case, it definitely was. Maybe in this genre, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. So I, I started there. And again, I started from the absolute bottom. And, but, you know, I, it was like nothing was really working. Like the hair color wasn't working. The salons weren't working. All of a sudden I felt it kind of starting to click that maybe I could do this. And they really took me under their wing. And in a very long story of how much they took me under their wing. But eventually I started to do photo shoots. Mm. And like any job with photo shoot, there are baby ones. There are little ones. There are small jobs that maybe nobody else wants to do. Or it's August in New York right now. And traditionally, August is a month where the business slows down. Well. I worked all August, you know, just trying to get my foot in. And those are, those are, so I started and I was very fortunate to work with great people. And uh, in, in the world of fashion, a lot of times we have agents as a hairstylist. I have an agent, her name is Susan Price and uh, they help us. Right. So, uh, so there was an agent named Omar who helped me. He worked, for Orbe as well. And so nobody was available. And he would say, well, what do you want to try Jimmy? And a few people said yes. So that's how I I built it. That's how I, you know, I, that's where I started. And I had some incredibly lucky breaks. And so have I, you ever had any situations where you're showing up at a shoot, right? Whether it be fashion or something like fashion week or whatever. And you are presenting your ideas and they're just like, no. <laughs> all the time. Really? <laughs> all, the, 
all the time. That's that's what makes it extremely stressful because uh, you know that I I know everybody has heard this saying. Well, it's not brain surgery, right? Or like, oh, it's just hair. No, but it, <laughs> it is artistic um, interpretation, I guess. You know, well, I, you can. Everybody a, has a different vision. You cannot imagine how in much importance people put on hair because what happens is is that it helps define the whole look of the woman or the photograph or it, it's, it becomes extremely important in context to the look to so say you're doing a fashion I'm doing a fashion show I think it has something to do with the first thing people look at when they look at someone on the street, in a picture, on a fashion show, is they look at eyes. They look because the eyes are what's how you can tell someone's a human, how someone's healthy, how someone's like, it's a difference between a mannequin, right? That our eyes move, right? And so the first thing they look at is the eyes and eyes and hair are so close together, right? So that they start to put, the picture together and the image of the woman together from they start with the head the face the hair so it it says it's it is the design fashion designers image and message so what i do is i'm i'm creating an image for the designer so you know imagine the responsibility oh they have God. to trust they have to trust me to do that. But that's almost no different than the person that sits in your chair, right? Exactly. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, again, it's like helping them actualize their vision. I mean, that that is, but it, there's a lot of trust in that. There's a lot of trust in that. And I mean, and it, it goes, it could go from, I mean, I know that you know, sometimes like somebody will say, I just want a little trim and you give them a little trim and there's sort of an ease to it. But you know, if that little trim goes wrong, that is very, it's an alarm goes off for the client. And, and it's the same in the fashion business, but it's at a bigger scale and, <laughs> and a bigger price, uh, a lot of money on, on the, uh, in a lot of their reputation and everything that goes with that. So there can be uh, a lot of anxiety in the fashion business it's not for everybody but i think i think and i and i've told this to people that have asked me about the job you have to really want it you have to love it because otherwise it's there's it's thankless right the hours are long the pay isn't always great the the i think the speed sometimes also of how quickly you have to come up with these ideas because I mean, I know yeah. that you you're not going to know anything about the models, anything about the clothing until right before, and you have to come up with a plan and make sure you can execute it on everybody. I I can't even fathom wrap my brain around how quickly and how organized you got to be in order to have that done. Yes, but say for someone like Jason Wu, uh, you know, he's a very sophisticated man and very kind and. And very good at business and, and being organized. So what we'll do is we'll have a meeting. And I'll go in for a meeting with the makeup artists and with the fashion stylist. So there's a group of us. And they will show me the clothes. And they will talk about hair ideas. And usually the Jason Wu woman is uh, sleek and has like sleek, shiny, healthy hair often tied back somehow. And, and so then we have a model and we call it a hair and makeup test. So we'll try out things in variations on that theme, on this sort of sleek look. And uh, so we do have some, we have a foundation of what the idea will be, but I'm still under the gun. I'm still oh, yeah. with, people watching me work. And that has its own anxiety. And believe me, if I didn't love the final outcome, 
I wouldn't want to do it. It's because that's not that's stressful. And there's other th- there's other ways to survive in life that are less stressful. But I love the I love the world. So it's it's worth it for me. So I it brings back to because I I mean I love the fact that Jason does do that beautiful, sleek, gorgeous look. And and right now so many people are mimicking that in the street to begin with. Yes. But I do find like Models hair is definitely like I've worked on a few different models that yeah. have done different shoots. And then by the time you got them, you know, they have all kinds of stuff going on. Those poor things sometimes that they go through. Um, I love the fact that like they really do consider everything when it comes to that to make sure that they're not really doing anything that's going to be detrimental to their career because that's their hair. Absolutely. And you know, one thing I've learned is that some women will have a sense of their hair mm. and and know, say to me, oh, don't use this, use that, or be careful with that brush, or my hair doesn't work well with heat or that kind of heat. Or But some people don't have that gift and they just sort of sit there and trust and their hair can be really beat up. I mean, certainly even the people that have an, a tremendous uh, sense of their hair, their hair can get beat up. But I've seen girls' hair be ruined and it ruin their careers. It might, it might ruin their careers because they don't have nice hair anymore. And it might ruin their careers because it ruined their esteem. It ruined their confidence because imagine some 16 year old girl or whatever age a model is when they start, uh, hopefully 18 or, or above, and they come with their regular hair that everybody told them their whole life that you're beautiful or you're interesting looking, whatever their image of themselves was. And then within six months, it's up to here and it's broken. And, and sometimes models are people with, uh, feeling so it it can just destroy their confidence. So the idea of me, I love to make people, regardless of what situation I'm in, is make people feel comfortable. So you know, like we were talking earlier, like say for instance the number nine by Olaplex, right? So you have a foundation, a prep kind of product that you're protecting the hair, you're getting it into. Uh, a curl pattern or you're helping it to have the memory say if we're doing it all up you you start that foundation of putting it in that direction and yes. you're already conditioning the hair i mean to talk a little bit about olaplex i think that you know as someone in my position and i'm i when I, i'm putting my name together with something right the idea of that there is the innovation that Olaplex has is so unique that they have these patented uh, innovations and that are all about the health of the hair. I don't know off the top of my head, and I know you can agree, it's a very short list of, of brands that have that. So yeah, if any, not, not so like Olaplex, that's for sure. Yeah, so it's a <laughs> thrilling thing to be able to, and to be able to bring this to the fashion business right so whether it's the number six whether i'm smoothing hair out and because that's a big part of my uh look right is sort of blowing hair out right as a foundation maybe i mean i love curls but even the curls that i do i do tons of the natural look and natural texture but i also do a lot of curling iron a lot of blow drying a lot of straightening iron so to have these built-in products that have protection uh, not that you can't. September, you they still have that humidity going on in New York City. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, it will be very. I'm all, always afraid, and I don't even want to put it out in the universe. But like, yes, there is the the there having is an anti frizz is always helpful in a in a runway show for sure. <laughs> yeah, no frizz in a runway show is very important. Yeah, and so yes, like, and we were talking about the number nine, the oil. It's it's very light. Uh, in also, what people don't always realize is that 
for fashion hair, uh, say it's a fashion shoot, like we might try something in the morning and maybe it'll be a very sleek, tight ponytail kind of style. Mm -hmm. But then oh, they, I bet the number seven works so good with that, that oil. Yes, yes, so good with that. But then they might say, we don't like that. <laughs> Let's do it giant ways. It's so important that the products are, you can move. They, they keep the hair clean. Mm -hmm. So these products that we're naming are light enough that then you could add something to make volume and make it big. And it won't be drenched. Of course, you could overuse products, but if you don't overuse these products, the hair will be clean and you could change it. And then go back to the ponytail. Because sometimes they'll say that, ah, you know, the ponytail was the better idea. So then you've got to go back in with the heat. So imagine yeah. what you're doing to a model's hair in one day. And the same thing goes with fashion shows. Maybe they're getting, maybe they have four fashion shows in the day. And every yes. time style with extensions and sprays and anyway, I interrupted you. What were you going to no, say? No, no, no. I was, I, 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 valid point, valid point. I, it's funny because I keep thinking with, you know, our listeners might not completely understand because I mean, obviously we all style our hair. And when we're talking about, you know, creating that baseline, you know, is like, you know, using the number nine, you know, having that, that's going to create memory. When we say memory, we're saying when you're blowing out your hair, it's not that you're going to get necessarily like that curl you would get from a curling iron. It is getting that volume, getting it to move to that movement. Um, it's very important in a good hairstyling to get that baseline started first before you do all that other stuff. Um, I didn't I know that before beauty school, believe it or not. Yes, I mean, I think the direction that hair is going to be, I mean, that's why I always, I like to start off in most cases with clean hair mm. and clean, washed and conditioned hair because then you could start to make, okay, so say if I'm going to do something like a side part and it, it easily goes into the part and then you put something in with memory and it's going to, the part's going to stay and then I start to work with my hands and you're halfway there already, right? Because you can kind of play with it around the person's face and find what's flattering and see what the next step will be. Okay, do we naturally dry it? Do we blow dry it smooth? Do we add uh, curling iron? Or do I, am I going to scrunch it? Or, you know, what, what, what are we going to do? I'm and actually really impressed that you start with clean hair because, like, for years you would never hear that about someone that was doing a whole styling thing. Yes, I mean, it was just, it's just a unique thing to me. Now, I you'll remember this with, with uh, from your salon thing that like, say, if somebody was going to do a wedding updo, right. oh, it's good to have the hair uh, a day dirty or something like that. I never really understood that, but I'm <laughs> sure that those people, yeah. I'm sure those people have their reason. I never really got it. Now, if you have, um, if you have very coarse hair that you, uh, that's a different story. If you have very coarse hair that you're wearing straight, yes, yes, to wash it and it blows up back to curly and then have to just straighten it again, that is a case where freshly washed hair isn't the best idea. But um, yeah, it's, it really depends on the texture. But wow. so. I definitely, I, it's, it's fascinating. Cause like I said, when I was younger, I did not, I didn't know the whole concept of like creating the shape with the blow dryer and a brush and getting that down first in order to have not just like, say, you know, loose waves, you know, well, so popular, the beach waves and all that other stuff. But even if I wanted to do something like a little cute bun or you know a high ponytail or something like that because they did have hair once upon a time uh, <laughs> but I didn't really understand when you had that really great base with you know the right products that are going to have a little bit of memory it's going to make your job so much easier plus get more out of the hairstyle 
Yes, yes. So even back to to talk about the different textures of hair that yeah. people are born with, I want to work start out with hair that is is clean looking, meaning like you could brush it, you could move it. So that that way I could create something. So uh, and that's what's great about like so even for hair that's uh, curlier that these kind of products will just have quality. It's all about the quality of the hair, the health of the hair, how the shine of the hair, the movement. And I think that that's where beauty starts for me. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Now I, I do have to ask because, you know, again, Jason Wu, sure. we have that entire look that's sleek and gorgeous, but I've seen some of your editorial work. Oh, that you. has to take a lot. Like, Talk about creativity. I've seen some, is there any particular shoot that you think of? Cause I've seen you have done more celebrities than I can possibly imagine. Like, was there ever a shoot that you looked at and went like, bam, like I can't, I, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I can't get any better than this. Absolutely not because I, I'm always interested in tomorrow and not resting oh. on my laurels. I mean, that's... Okay, so the, name, name your your top favorites. Well, uh, I have mentioned the photographer, Stephen Mizell. He is... Um, I think of him as, work, as, as being the premier... Uh, you know, I think as human beings, we get to witness genius. And, uh, you know, we, I spoke of... We spoke of David Bowie and Grace Jones and uh, think of someone like Aretha Franklin or like those people were geniuses in their field. And uh, and they also got very famous. So we all know their names. But say like. Uh, um, in any field. Well, in my field, Stephen Mizell was is the genius that I've been around, not the only one, but to be in that. Uh, it's a privilege, right? So to get to kind of be in the zone of that and for the hair to be working. And uh, so, yes, there has been some moments when I've been like, oh my goodness. I can't even imagine like to this be is able working. to do your art. Cause that, I mean, I'm sorry. It please everybody. If you have a chance, go look up his oh, work to see your art, but, or, and, and be able to create and beautiful models, these gorgeous actresses. Yes, that helps. That helps. But then to have a genius photographer capture your your hard work, that beautiful moment, and that gorgeous model that's going to capture that. I wow, that must be so. I don't know. Like I'm a little jealous right now, Jimmy. Oh well, <laughs> and thank you. Well, it's definitely. I think the joy that I didn't know I was going to experience and the tremendous privilege is the teamwork. Mm. And so never really, it's never about my idea. Uh, it, it's more about the magic that happens with us together. Those are the most fulfilling days. Like I, you know, if I go in with like a really rigid idea, like this is what I'm going to do today, sometimes it can go really flat because people aren't don't feel a part of it. But if it kind of happens, you know, that's the thing about photo shoots, like, right, you get there and everybody's together and then things just sort of happen in, in front of us, you know, because we're trying and we're staying with it and we're staying with the process. And uh, maybe some of your uh, uh audience have heard of the makeup artist Pat McGrath. Uh, this is another genius I've gotten to work with. And um, and I've been lucky enough to work with the model Linda Evangelista. Like these people are so extraordinary. So I mean, you know, she's a but, goddess. <laughs> yes. And then and then you know and then the newer generations like Gigi and Bella Hadid, they're both and not to lump them together because they're incredible individuals. Uh, one of the people definitely that I had the incredible privilege of meeting when I was an assistant and still know, and I've done her hair recently is Naomi Campbell. Wow. And, you know, and just to, and to go back to my mom, there is, I'm so blessed that I have that foundation because 
in my position as a hairstylist, and I think in every hairstylist position is we are supporting these people that we're working with. Mm -hmm. So to be able to be there as a support to these women that I'm naming and, and to help them with their confidence. Because of course, as hairstylists, as you know, it's not just hair, right? We're listening to, we're listening to, uh, you know, sometimes we have to kind of decipher what people want. You know, they might not say, I want this black and white idea. They might say, oh, I kind of want it like this. I kind of think maybe it's this. And, you know, we have to focus and give our undivided attention. And everybody has a different language in how they communicate. So you have to be well-versed in all languages, so to speak. Yes. Trim is this or this. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and this could be a heart attack. So, <laughs> or right. blonde could mean so many things, right? Oh gosh, uh -oh. yeah, yeah. No, it's it's, and I like I said, I am grateful for the fact that the internet is definitely making it more um, accessible for people to have a better understanding, so they can have conversations. Um, I know I try on my social media to kind of talk about that language because it makes it a lot easier for everybody to get what they want and make a hairdresser's life a lot easier for sure. But also really help that person get really what they want. It's very hard sometimes. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it is hard, but it's it, on the good days, it's worth it. It's no, really definitely, hard. definitely. Well, with that being said, I feel like I've taken so much of your time and this was just so Blown joyful. By. I enjoyed this so much and Thank congratulations, you. congratulations you. on the Jason Wu uh, show, which I have to say, like, I can't wait to see because again, we're recording this earlier, but um, I want to say thank you so much for coming on and I can't wait to work with you again. Thank you, Danielle. Me too. It's a pleasure. Thanks.